Hi, I'm Tony Northrup, and for my photography buying guide, I'm going to give you a preview of the newly announced Pentax 645Z DSLR. This is a medium format camera with more than 50 megapixels. So it's a Sony made sensor, and I expect that we're going to get never before seen image quality out of it. Uh, let's take a deeper look at it. As you can see here, because it's medium format and thus bigger than a traditional 35 millimeter based DSLR, it has a 0.79 crop factor. That's right. If you're going to figure out equivalent focal length and equivalent apertures, you're going to have to actually decrease those numbers. An f 2.8 lens becomes like an f 2.2 lens. It's pretty cool. The sensor itself is 51.4 megapixels with no anti-aliasing filter. Again, this is a Sony made sensor and they have a reputation for making just amazing sensors. So I think this is going to really blow us away. It also features pretty good autofocus system, which is rare in these big medium format cameras. It's got 25 cross type focusing points and three low light focusing points, which should let it focus down to negative three AV. Uh, if you're not familiar with the EV system, that's like, moonlight basically uh, so you should be able to take it out of the studio and work with it in real environments including doing night photography i think this might be the best camera ever for night photography it takes a lousy three frames per second with only a 10 image buffer um, that combined with the large sensor size means it's definitely not going to be a sports camera <laughs> in fact you know it's it's closest in weight to uh, this of my camera size and weight um, though it's about the same weight as a 1dx um, but the lenses are going to be generally bigger and heavier too so this is a studio landscape night photography camera you can hand hold it but it's often going to be on a tripod uh, so that three frames a second shouldn't really hold you back for the types of photography that you're going to be doing with it the sensor is designed to support up to ISO 200,000 and in 35 millimeter equivalent terms, that would be like ISO 350,000. We have to kind of adjust that ISO to compensate for it being a larger sensor. So in other words, you'd be gathering about the same amount of light that you could on a 35 millimeter camera if it actually supported 350,000 natively, which they don't tend to. It also has a USB 3 connection. Finally, we see some USB 3 on cameras. This is really important for medium format cameras because they're often used in the studio where they need to be tethered to a computer. When you tether a com uh, camera to a computer, an art director can look at the pictures as they're flowing off the camera and give you feedback about it. Uh, this is really important in the studio and other cameras like the Canon 1DX and the Nikon D4S use ethernet for this, but I, I'm glad to see somebody using USB 3.0 because it tends to be uh, flexible and a little more direct than having to go through a network cable. Let's look at some pictures of it here. It has an articulating 3.2 inch screen. Um, it's not a touch screen, unfortunately. Everybody tells me pros don't watch touch screens, but I do. <laughs> it's so useful to be able to flip through pictures with your finger and to zoom in with your fingers and then pan around the picture to check critical focus throughout the frame. There's simply no easy way to do that when you're using buttons and a little joystick on the back of the camera. And for the professional workflow, it allows you to proof your pictures on the back of the camera very, very quickly. And I say on the slide that it has an awesome viewfinder and I've not looked through it, but I have looked through the viewfinders on the 645D and many other medium format cameras. And you know it right away compared to 35 millimeter full frame cameras. The image is so big and bright thanks to that large, large sensor. Now this is a DSLR, just like our 35 millimeter DSLRs, which means it has a mirror, which means you're physically looking through the lens. That's right, it's not an electronic viewfinder. So it's really important to gather as much light as possible. And I think once you look through a medium format camera like this, you'll be absolutely <laughs> blown away. Your 35 millimeter camera's viewfinder just seems like small and dim by comparison. So this Pentax has some features that most of us will consider super lame. <laughs> it has live view, yes, which every DSLR has had for like a decade now. It also does 1080p video, which has been standard since the 5D Mark II came out some long time ago. Uh, it has focus peaking, which isn't common on DSLRs necessarily, but is standard on uh, most new mirrorless cameras. And it has a mic jack. So why are these things 
even worth mentioning? Well, medium format cameras don't tend to have these features because they tend to be designed for single purpose in studio use. Pentax is making a camera that's going to compete more with the Canon and Nikon DSLRs that we can take everywhere. It's also weatherproofed, allowing you to bring it out when it's raining a little bit and not worry about it so much. They're trying to get you that big sensor in a package that you're comfortable with and that you can take with you, and I think it's a brilliant strategy. Another feature designed for professional use is the dual SD card slots. Uh, we use this on the 1DX and the D4S and the 5D Mark III all the time. It'll record pictures to two cards. You do this because sometimes cards fail. It doesn't happen often, but I have had a couple of cards corrupted. If you can imagine, if you were paying thousands of dollars for models and studio time and lights and makeup and outfits and hair just to have your memory card fail, and you have to go back and reshoot everything? Or what if you're a wedding photographer and you lose your pictures? You can't go back and recreate the wedding at all, right? Well, this wouldn't be a great wedding camera. I think it's a little cumbersome for that. Here we can see the relative weight next to some cameras that you might be familiar with. Uh, it's about 3.5 pounds or 1.5 kilograms, and that makes it about the same weight as a 1DX, though it's a physically much deeper package because that that mirror in there has to be the same size as the sensor, basically a little bit bigger. So like this medium format film camera, it has to have a really deep mirror box and that's why it sticks out so much. Uh, the D4S is a little bit lighter and uh, you know, it's gonna be close to twice the weight of like a 5D Mark III, one and a half times the weight, somewhere in there. Um, so it's a nice heavy camera, which uh, especially when you put on those bigger and heavier lenses, it's not gonna be a camera that you're gonna necessarily enjoy traveling around with, though I, I spent a lot of time traveling with these big medium format film cameras and uh, I always enjoyed it. I heard a funny bit of trivia from somebody who was previewing it. They said that the shutter is quieter than the A7R. So why is that significant? Because, well, the mirror has to flip out of the way and the shutter has to fire and that can be pretty loud. I'll just fire off this camera real quick. Um, so that gives you some sense for <laughs> what a medium format film camera can sound like, and that's a fairly quiet one. It's a much bigger piece of material that has to move out of the way, and as such it makes more sound. So the A7R is about the noisiest <laughs> mirrorless camera in existence, um, but they pointed out that it's a little bit quieter than that. It's also going to be louder than just about any other DSLR. Another good reason that is not necessarily like a wedding and funeral or photojournalism type camera, but more suited to the studio. Pentax is saying that the pricing is about $8,500 in the US or uh, about 6,800 pounds in the UK. And that is the pricing that they have it for a presale at B&H, so you can check that out. Now, by comparison, the Pentax 645D, the existing model, which was released in 2010, is about 7K new, and you can pick one up used for about 5K. And I'd like to just show off DxO Mark's comparison of the Pentax 645D, the existing model, the old model, versus some modern DSLRs. You can get a sense for the image quality. So you can see, even though it has a much bigger sensor, it rates at uh, 82, which is about the same as the Canon 1DX and significantly worse than the D4S. Those are the top end professional 35 millimeter camera. So it's not all about sensor size, right? You can have a bigger sensor that doesn't have better image quality than smaller sensors. Engineering is certainly a factor, but I think the new Sony sensor is going to level the playing field and allow it to kick the butt of all our full frame 35 millimeter cameras. Also, I find this last entry here funny. Uh, it actually has the same rating as my new Sony A6000, which has a 1.5x crop APS-C size sensor. That's right. So it has a sensor that has like three times the surface area of an APS-C camera, but about the same image quality. It's a few years old, and it was a Kodak developed sensor, uh, so it wasn't necessarily the best technology out there. There's a bunch, a bunch, a bunch of lenses out there that you can use going back to the 80s when the 645 system uh, was first around in the film world. And some of those will, you can go back even farther with adapters and such. Uh, but Pentax also announced a bunch of new lenses to go with this camera, and I, I bet you're going to want to pretty much limit yourself to these new lenses because. 
hopefully they're designed for this outrageous 50 megapixel sensor uh, so that we can actually get some sharpness out of it because if you were to go and use some big medium format lens from 1985 you'd find that it just wasn't sharp and what's the point of having a 50 megapixel sensor if you're not getting sharp images by using sharp lenses so a quick preview of the new zoom lenses that they announced they have a series of five new zoom lenses out there covering basically every focal length from a 35 millimeter equivalent of 26 millimeters to 240 millimeters something i'd like to point out as you look at this is in parentheses i put the 35 millimeter uh, equivalent uh, focal lengths and apertures for these lenses because that's what we're familiar with right and if you do that you'll see that none of these are especially sharp <laughs> Like, I think most pros who would be spending close to 10K on a body are probably going to be using, in, in the 35mm world, 24-70 to f2.8s, and then the famous 70-200 to f2.8s. And none of these lenses are anywhere near that fast. They don't have that same light gathering ability. It also means that they won't have the same ability to blur the background. So one of the things they do want this camera to do is to be a portrait camera. But if you can't blur the background all that well, it's really not going to do the trick. But then again, pros tend to be planning their shots. And when you plan your shots, you have a better ability to use a prime lens. Zoom lenses are better for weddings and such. And again, I don't see that as the primary purpose for this camera. So let's look at their new primes. You can see they announce a lot more new primes and zooms, which is different than the 35 millimeter DSLR roller. Everybody wants lots and lots of zooms because they're consumers or wedding photographers or something. Again, commercial photographers and landscape photographers, which are gonna love this. Um, prefer these prime, prime lenses because they're much sharper and much faster. Um, and again, the speeds of none of these are gonna blow you away. Uh, you know, 35 millimeter equivalent apertures of f2.2 or f2.8, uh, we see lots of prime lenses in the 35 millimeter world that go down to f1.8. So they'll actually be gathering more light than these lenses, even on the bigger sensor, more total light. These zoom lenses uh, range in price from the, the cheapest tier is $700 all the way up to five grand for that uh, beautiful 25 millimeter, 20 millimeter equivalent lens here. I think, you know, the lens that I want out of this, <laughs> I, I'd want a couple of nice portrait lenses because that's what I'd want to do with it. I'd want to grab myself that uh, 150 millimeter uh, 2.8, which is like 120 millimeter F2.2 for $1,400. That would give you great bouquet for portraits. Um, and as far as headshot lenses go, oh, I'd want that 300 millimeter F4 at 240 millimeters and an equivalent aperture of f3.2, you'd get just fantastic compression of facial, facial features and you'd be able to blur the background and you'd have a 50 megapixel headshot. <laughs> I don't know why you'd want a 50 megapixel headshot. <laughs> that would be, that would require some serious retouching. You'd probably have pores like <laughs> the size of my fist, uh, but nonetheless, I want it. Maybe I don't need it, but I want it. This camera is coming in the spring of 2014, and I think it's gonna be a dream come true for commercial photographers who are kind of starting out and can't afford those big hassies. Uh, it's also gonna be a great camera for landscape photographers who don't feel like doing panoramas, but wanna extract as much detail as possible and wanna be able to make like those big, huge, fine art prints. I think at $8,000, the price is great. You know, it's starting to approach high-end 35 millimeter cameras. I love the lens selection. I applaud them for coming with a good list of lenses, which say Sony didn't do when they came with that beautiful full frame uh, mirrorless camera, the a7 and the a7r. So thanks for giving us some real lenses to work with. Thanks for making it a price that we can afford. I really think this system is going to finally take off. It's been around for a long time. Uh, but it was kind of high price and the sensor uh, quality wasn't that great. I am going to be drooling over getting one for my studio, so we just might consider that because for things like commercial and stock imagery, where you're frequently shooting billboards and magazines, where you want everything to be 300 dpi, uh, it could really make a difference and in fact, it could help me make more money. And that's what it's all about, right? For landscape photographers, it's going to allow you to make just big, huge prints with detail that would be impossible without, say, creating panoramas, you know, stitching together multiple images. So we're really excited about it, and uh, we hope that we'll be able to review it just as soon as it comes out. Be sure to subscribe to see that. And if you want tons of detail about camera gear, lenses, flashes, studio lighting, everything else, be sure to check out my photography buying guide. It's uh, just about 
280 pages, but it's growing all the time because I put out lifetime updates. So there's a ton of information in there. Uh, check it out. If you have any questions, just write a comment down below. Don't forget to give me a like, please. Thank you.